listening to Michael Savage Archives on Really Big Something Channel. August 10th, 2009. For this young man, he has the right to be represented. I'm his father, and I want to talk to you face to face. Under the Obama health care plan, which you support, this man would be given no care whatsoever because he is a cerebral palsy handicapped person. We put an amendment in which will address his specific problem as the bill was going to. Be- Well, the Democrats are having a very blue Monday. That was the sound, that was the voice of a father who went to a town hall meeting with Congressman Dingell. Dingell got up there to do the normal dog and pony fake town hall meeting. This man has a, a, a an adult son with uh, cerebral, cerebral palsy. The man got up and demanded answers from Dingell, and Dingell gave him the finger, basically. And Nancy Pelosi says that it is un-American to talk to your congressman honestly. Nancy Pelosi says it is un-American for a town hall meeting to actually have people from the town in the hall. Nancy Pelosi says it is un-American for anyone to speak at a town hall meeting, except Nancy Pelosi and those who want six Gulfstream 550 jets in every uh, pot. This is the Savage Nation. We're going to talk about health care reform, how this is the Waterloo for the Democrat Party, how they're finally meeting the people and finding out that enough is enough, that Obama's been exposed for the neo-Marxist fraud that he is. And speaking of Obama, here we have a country that's going up in smoke, and he goes to Guadalajara, Mexico, and promises the illegal aliens that he's going to give them health care. I don't think you understand the subtext of this entire so-called health insurance debate. It is about making certain that Obama's friends in La Raza are rewarded for having brought out the illegal alien vote for him. It is about granting health care to non-citizens. It is about bankrupting the American health care system along with everything else in order to make certain that the illegal aliens primarily from Mexico and all of their relatives get a gold-plated medical care system. We can talk about that as well. Now, we're going to talk about the health insurance reform bill that is in the works because the Democrat liars have changed it from a health care bill to a health insurance reform bill. What they really want to do is make certain that the government becomes the master insurer. Now, why would the government want to be the master insurer? For the same reason we have a Federal Reserve that insures our currency. Now, you know what a great job the Federal Reserve has done in insuring the value of our currency. Without a gold standard, without a silver standard, there is no standard. They're printing paper. And it's the same with health insurance reform. They want to make certain that they can hold the paper. And think of the billions of dollars that are going to be made by Pelosi's friends, who are suddenly going to pop up to provide the insurance for the government. Think about the underwriting that Wall Street is going to get out of this. Think about all of the collateral fortunes that are going to be made from these uh, uh, health insurance reform bills that are circulating right now. Now, I know a little bit about health care for a number of reasons. A, I'm an American. I'm over 60. I go to the doctor. Today, I went to the dermatologist to have certain things removed. I pay for it. I pay for my own health care plan. When I was young and I didn't have any money, I had to pay for my own health care, my children's health care. Go back to the last generation. My father was the sole bread uh, bread winner in the family, immigrant, immigrant family. Father got a heart attack. I was in college. Guess what? Guess who paid for it? Nobody. I had to leave college for a semester to help run a store. What happened to me as a result? Nothing. I graduated six months later. Did it end my life? No, it made me stronger. So what? Would I need uh, uh, Uncle Uncle Sam to pay for it? Well, I guess if Uncle Sam was willing to pay for it, uh, fine, it would have been great. But Uncle Sam wasn't willing to pay for it. Did it ruin my family? No. I don't want to hear that there's no way for poor people to take care of themselves. They took care of themselves for centuries before Danny Hoss, uh, uh, Nancy Pelosi came along. So I go to the dermatologist and I pay for it myself. I go in there today. I have certain spots on my skin after all of the years of being around. And she says, well, you got a barnacle on your back. She says, please lie down on your stomach. She says, this will only hurt for a moment. She takes out the scalpel and it only hurt for a moment. And then I heard a scraping sound on my back and I said, doctor, what are you doing? She said, I'm sanding 
the base of the barnacle off. I said, who is going to do the varnishing? The guy who does my boat? Well, it was a nice uh, joke. And then, of course, she had to spray my face with the hot, the cold stuff, which I have done every six months, because of the years that I indulged the sun. As you well know, the sun is your enemy. Uh, I want to talk about the absurdity of, of, of health and preventative health, uh, the, the, the conflicting, the conflicting uh, uh, opinions that you get. For years, you were told, stay out of the sun, it will kill you. And it's probably a good idea to stay out of the sun, it will kill you. Now, all of a sudden... The uh, doctor freaks are telling you to get as much vitamin D as you can or you're going to die. As a That's the latest hula hoop in the medical profession. They've all discovered vitamin D deficiency. You don't need vitamin C. You don't need vitamin E. You don't need B6. You don't need pyridoxine. You don't need riboflavin. You don't need niacin. You don't need vitamin E. They've all been proven no good. But listen to your doctor quack. He tells you to get as much vitamin D as you can. They don't know what the hell they're talking about, most of them. But the fact of the matter is, it's conflicting with stay out of the sun. I will tell you that preventive medicine is the most important thing that you can engage in, trying to prevent disease before it occurs. Now, you're not only going to be, you're not always going to be successful at that, obviously, but uh, food is the best medicine, as you well know. And I've written books on this going back to 19, God, it's a long time ago, 1972, Earth Medicine, Earth Foods, Macmillan Publishing. 1972, so I've been at this area, in this uh, uh, realm of study for a very long period of time. And traditional cultures have long advised people on how to eat well in order to live well. It's only in our culture where the doctors and the food establishment lie to the people, tell them to eat the Oreos, tell them to go have the hot dogs, tell them to go have the cheeseburgers, tell them to go have the fatty meals and take a cholesterol pill, and there, there, you'll be fine. So the quacks with stethoscopes continue their lies. They tell you to poison your arteries, they tell you to poison your skin, and then they tell you to take a little pill and continue to poison yourself. All of the health insurance reform in the world is not going to lower costs unless the people become proactive uh, in their own health. And so I say to you, food is the best medicine, and you should arm yourself with the best knowledge. And I hardly recommend healing children naturally, which can only be found on michaelsavage.com. I wrote it in 1982. I republished it last year. It's still the best book ever written on diet and nutrition for children and prospective parents. Now, speaking about food being the best medicine, I'm also a man who loves eating and food. And last night, i got to tell you, I had the best eggplant in the world at my friend Lorenzo's North Beach restaurant. Now, this is not so much a plug as it is to tell you that when you go in there next time, you say to him, I want the savage eggplant. Now, what is the Savage Eggplant? Why? It's not even on the menu. It should be, Lorenzo, but okay, I won't even charge you for it. Let me explain why I'm mentioning the Savage Eggplant. I love eggplant. Years ago, I read that the black skin of the eggplant is extremely protective against various skin conditions, including early stages of skin cancer. Now, of course, the studies are uh, not pronouncedly uh, advanced to the extent that you could say this definitively to be true. But there is evidence to suggest that some of these folkloric claims have validity. And I tend to believe that many folkloric claims do have great validity in the sense that uh, when I was an anthropology graduate student a long time ago, I learned that the reason folk uh, remedies continue to persist down through the ages is because they work. And I learned also that folk tales persist from generation to generation because there is some truth in them. And the folk tales that have no truth disappear in time. And so, therefore, I eat a lot of eggplant. But I'll tell you something. You try to get eggplant cooked properly, it's almost impossible. It's a very difficult dish to cook properly. I get it, for example. My, my savage eggplant is cooked perfectly. It has no cheese on it. And it's covered in a pomodoro sauce. It's unbelievable. It's perfect. And the reason I eat it without cheese is because I'm on a no-dairy diet. And I'm going to talk about that for a minute. Why am I on a no-dairy diet? Because I found, although I had incredibly great health, thus far to this stage of my life I've had no surgery, I'm on no medication. Would you believe it? Most people my age are on seven medications, and they want Uncle, Uncle Schmuck to pay for every medication. And, of course, the doctor is very happy to prescribe another medication for you. You could say I've been very lucky. I have been lucky. Tomorrow I could be unlucky. I know how the world works. 
But the fact of the matter is, I've also watched everything I've put in my mouth for 30 years. I've taken mega doses of vitamin C, vitamin E, B vitamins, and various doses of garlic and wine and vodka and beer. And all of them have worked uh, superbly, as have my daily bicycle rides, uh, which Dr. Kellogg highly recommended uh, uh, for your balance, if not for anything else. We'll talk about how much you need to exercise in a moment. But again, I want to go back to the overall statement that I'm making about uh, why I am on a non-dairy diet. About six months ago, no, about a year ago, I started to get severe pains in my in my feet, not in my legs, but in the ball of my foot where I was limping. And my left hand, I couldn't close it. And I said, this is absurd. I, don't, I shouldn't have arthritis. I'm in good health. Well, I again went back to my own writings of 30 years ago, and I said, doctor, practice what you preach. Dr. Savage, practice what you preach. Don't you remember writing 30 years ago that the literature was uh, filled with evidence that certain people cannot tolerate dairy because they do not have sufficient quantities of lactase to, to, to uh, break down the lactose found in milk products? And that some people get relief from arthritis by eliminating all dairy. That means hard cheeses, that means milk, that means ice cream, etc. Well, guess what happened? I gave up all dairy, and I mean butter. I mean small amounts of milk and coffee. I mean what I loved the most, which was Parmesan cheese, Pecorino Romano. I loved it. I was on everything. I won't touch it. And you know what? I stopped limping, and my hand is fine. And if I cheat on my diet so much as one meal, the pain comes back. So as I say to you, you want to have a good discussion about real health care reform, real health insurance reform. It starts at your dinner table. You are the ultimate doctor to yourself. Don't rely upon anyone else until you absolutely need them. Anyway, these are some of the topics that I want to talk about today. We also have sound of President Obama in Mexico, of all places, promising the Mexicans once again that health care reform is on the way and that Uncle Schmuck will give them all a gold-plated uh, medical care system if only he can continue to BS the public a little bit more. I'll be right back. Yeah, 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 yeah. So if your child has Parkinson's, uh, cerebral palsy, or if your grandmother has Parkinson's, according to Ram Emanuel's brother, Dr. Ezekiel Emanuel, uh, who was the brother of White House Chief of Staff Ram, who is now a mole inside the White House, he's a health policy advisor at the OMB, he's a member of the Federal Council on Comparative Effectiveness Research, uh, whatever that means, he says that doctors take their Hippocratic Oath too seriously. This is the compassionate uh, Ezekiel Emanuel. That's Ram's brother. He says doctors take the Hippocratic Oath too seriously. And he says uh, doctors should look beyond the needs of their patients and consider social justice. Those are progressive words, social justice such as whether the money could be better spent on somebody else. So in other words, if you have a grandmother with Parkinson's who's had a good life, that money could be better spent on a young Mexican illegal alien. After all, that young Mexican illegal alien has not yet uh, had a long good life. So according to Rahm Emanuel's brother, Ezekiel Emanuel, your grandmother should not be treated for Parkinson's, but that money should be spent on the illegal alien five-year-old, perhaps uh, because that child has a longer road ahead, and we need social justice. And of course, if eventually you have to take a communitarianism approach, uh, according to Ezekiel Emanuel, communitarianism, that will guide you. And he said that medical care should be reserved for the non-disabled. And it should not be given to those who are, quote, irreversibly prevented from being or becoming participating citizens. So in other words, this is very close to Dear Adolph's healthcare system. As you well know, the uh, social justice, uh, Adolf Hitler was a social justice uh, giver, and Hitler believed in social justice too. And Hitler didn't want to guarantee health services to patients who were not participating citizens, and so he started to euthanize disabled people. I don't know if you know this. Before the Jews were rounded up and exterminated by AAH, uh, Hitler started to exterminate the mentally incompetent and the disabled in good old Germany in the 1930s. But the average German was so appalled by the, the, the program of euthanizing the handicapped in Germany 
that good old Adolf and Hermann Goring stopped killing uh, such people and went on to killing somebody else. But of course it can't happen here because Ezekiel Emmanuel is not Hitler, Rahm Emanuel is not Hitler. These are good, honest, wonderful men who believe in the fair American way. And so if your grandmother has Parkinson's or a child has cerebral palsy, you can definitely understand that there will be discrimination against them. Of course, it will not be discrimination in the sense that you know it to be discrimination, because it will be framed as social justice. Now, of course, if you go and try to appeal to the government while they're euthanizing your child by not giving them the care that they need, you will be considered un-American by Nancy Pelosi, and perhaps you will be rounded up and put into an internment camp for, uh, well, an interminable period of time. You see, there are internment camps being planned. You may not under understand it because you didn't see it on CBS News. But I direct you to an article that came out over the weekend that will scare you to death. It came out on World Net Daily. I put it up on michaelsavage.com. Now you say, well, they're making it up. They're just scaring you. No. It's an ad for National Guardsmen to run internment camps. Savage. Yeah. So we're talking about a gangster group from Chicago trying to hijack the greatest medical care system the world has ever seen and convert it into something we don't even know. We don't know what this Frankenstein will look like. That's the amazing part. But if you actually read what Rahm Emanuel's brother Ezekiel has written, and it, we're talking about publications he's written for, such as the JAMA, June 18, 2008, where he says doctors take the Hippocratic Oath too seriously. In the Hastings Center report, uh, Rahm Emanuel's brother Ezekiel Emanuel says that we should have communitarian communitarianism decisions. And he says medical care should be reserved for the non-disabled, not those who are irreversibly prevented from being or becoming participating citizens. You know, I could see why that father whose son has MS, uh, a muscular dystrophy, tried to confront Dingle. I had a brother who was born disabled, so to speak, but so severely disabled that he couldn't walk, couldn't talk, couldn't hear. Well, they say he couldn't hear, but I whistled to him and he heard me, but I don't want to go into that stuff. He was blind, and he was totally, totally, um, just, that's the way it was. Well, I guess to Dr. Ezekiel Emanuel, my brother Jerome, should have been euthanized at birth. Because it cost a lot of money to take care of Jerome. And, of course, uh, think of the amount of money that uh, Ezekiel Emanuel could have spent on an illegal alien from Mexico, let us say, who was in a gun battle somewhere over drugs in uh, Los Angeles. Think about that. Think of the wonderful medical care that Ezekiel Emanuel can provide the tattooed folks in our prisons who are not even citizens with the money that could have gone to care for the disabled. You know, it's chilling when I read this to you to think what monsters these two guys are. Joining us right now is Dr. Frank Rosenblum, who is a brilliant man. Dr. Rosenblum wrote an article uh, uh, that published last week called "The Modern uh, Obama, the Modern-Day Roman Tyrant, which I quoted from I would say liberally, to use a phrase that I don't know if <laughs> you use. Dr. Rosenblum, welcome to the Savage Nation. Thanks for calling the show. Thank you very much for having me, Michael. Well, you wrote a brilliant article on uh, Obama and his in inclinations towards, towards a, a tyranny. But, you know, as a doctor, uh, let me just open it up. I mean, you know what Ezekiel Emanuel has written, right? You've seen this article? I do. I have, unfortunately, yes. Does he really mean this, that we should cut off, that the government will cut off any care to non-participating citizens? You know, I, I completely believe he means it. Uh, th as you know, Michael, and you've said so many times, uh, this is about an ideology. This is not about medical care. This is about making all of us dependent. And it's about doing things that will be best for the collective. This is, you know, where Obama and his minions are getting their uh, talking points uh, is the Communist Manifesto. Just put it up. Well, oh, wait, let's slow down because I believe you because I've studied them, but the average person is going to turn the radio off when you say that. I know that it's true. What in the world does Rahm Emanuel's brother Ezekiel Emanuel mean by communitarianism? What in the world is that? 
Well, the, the most important thing is the community. Individuals are not very important. Basically, you can uh, you can sacrifice individuals for the good of the collective, for the good of the whole. And so communitarianism means that you look at the, the whole population as a community and you set out the goals for the community, like the, uh, whatever, the five-year plans, etc. And then, you know, people can be killed, people can be sacrificed, people can be pushed away and pushed aside so that those particular goals, those socialistic, communist goals can be uh, can be arrived at why are the emmanuel brothers so un-american and i'm going to say it like it is they're both israelis are they not originally from israel or are they born here uh, i think they're I th they're they're of descent but i think they were i think they were born here. well i know their father fought in the Ergun. okay so they come from that genealogy but why would two american boys who have done so well in this country want to hijack the American way and turn it into something other than the American way. Look, you know with me, Frank, I'm not going to mince words. These guys are terrifying me. When I read that Ezekiel Emmanuel wrote the following, and I want to read it for, for the audience right now because no one is going to believe it. Here is a quote, uh, another quote from Rahm Emanuel's brother uh, from Lancet, a very respected British journal, Lancet, January 31, he says, he, dis he defends discrimination against older patients. Listen to what Ezekiel Emanuel says, quote, Unlike allocation by sex or race, allocation by age is not invidious discrimination. You see, every person lives through different life stages, says Ezekiel, rather than being a single age. So even if 25-year-olds receive priority over 65-year-olds, everyone who is 65 years now was previously 25 years. That is absolutely unbelievable to me. Unbelievable! Absolutely unbelievable. I mean, what's happening now? These are people who have grown up with this uh, far left liberal attitude that the United States is evil. That all of the and they they have guilt. They have the collective. If you want to use the term collective? They've got the collective collective liberal guilt. The problem is they want everyone else to pay for their guilt, just like they want everyone else to pay for their programs. Yeah, but I this think... kind of crap was limited to the universities for thirty years. Uh, the back wards of mental hospitals are filled with these former LSD cases. And now they're running the country. Believable to me. And you know what really is, is even more so is that people who are Jewish people can be supportive of these people. I oh, mean, yeah, let's lay it on the line, Dr. Rosenblum. The, the Emanuels are Jewish, are they not? They are. How in the world can two Jews from Israel talk about limiting medical care like this and sacrificing people with serious illnesses? How in the world does that comply with even their brand of Judaism, which is not so much religious as it is, what, what's the phrase liberal Jews use, that we're not religious, but we're, we believe in social justice? That's social justice to them, to take someone with Parkinson's and abandon them? Well, you know, I mean, look what happened with uh, Lenin and Sta Lenin. I mean, Lenin himself was Jewish. He, he threw Jews under the bus. He didn't care about uh, Judaism or about freedom of religion or about decency. He was instrumental in the murder, the killing of uh, how many hundreds of thousands of Jews. These people are free. Now, wait, Dr. Rosenblum, although you yourself are probably Jewish, you don't want to come under the microscopic eye of the uh, Anti-Defamation League, do you? Well, you know what? I'm, I was born Jewish, raised Catholic, so I'm actually a Jewish Catholic. But whatever the case is, I can guarantee you that I'm better, a better Jew than these guys are. <laughs> well, we won't go into that. I'm not going to judge anyone's better or worse. All I know is that these quotes from Rahm Emanuel's brother, Ezekiel Emanuel, came to light in a New York Post article of July 24th called Deadly Doctors by Betsy McAfee. Now, if it was only for the New York Post, you could dismiss it as a scandal writing. But these are quotes of Ezekiel from the Journal of the American Medical Association. These are quotes from him from the Hastings Center report. These are quotes directly from him that he wrote in the Lancet January 31. This is totally amazing. Wait, here's another one. Journal of the American Medical Association, June 18, 2008. Here's Rahm Emanuel's brother, Ezekiel, now a major policy advisor uh, on the so-called health reform. Listen to what he wrote. Here's what Emmanuel says. He says, quote, hospital rooms in the United States offer more privacy. Physicians' offices are typically more conveniently located and have parking nearby and have more attractive waiting rooms, quote, unquote, he means than necessary. In other words, Americans are getting too good medical care. Isn't that what he's saying? It's not much like the Cuba that he admires. Is that it? Exactly. Exactly. That's what he's saying. It's, well, it's where do, how, 
so look, Dr. Rosenblum, you see what's going on now. You see a father uh, goes to a town hall with uh, what's his name, Dingle, and he the father goes berserk, yelling at him and won't take no for an answer. And uh, now Nancy Pelosi calls such protesters un-American. Can you believe this? That's amazing. It's the very basis upon which America was founded. And the fact is that you know what kind of, really, fascism these people support. These people support lockstep fascism. I mean, it's like that Peter Singer, who's the uh, the uh, famous... Uh, ep- oh, God, I know. He called, I, re- I read him years ago. The uh, the uh, the euthani- the euthanizer, Peter Singer. Please don't tell me he's advising Obama. Please. I have no doubt that he is. I don't have any proof that he is, but I, I can't believe that he that there's not some of him in this. I mean, look, we're faced right now. I'm, I'm also president of Oregon Right to Life. And I'm telling you, you know, when you start degrading human existence and the value of human life, it never stops. It doesn't stop anywhere. You know, previously it was the, it was the Jews or the gypsies or the intellectuals when you went to uh, the communist countries. And now it's going to be what? It's going to be all the babies. It's going to be the people who aren't... Uh, fit to to uh, to support and promote the collective and it's going to be conservatives michael it's going to be conservatives well dr rosenblum you know that i have been banned from entry into the united kingdom and i have been very quiet about it but uh, not not for very long and i'm going to tie this into the to the monstrous regime that's running this country right now and their friends in the labor party in england we've just gotten letters from england that will make every american frightened my lawyer tried to reason with them to get my name off the list after it came out that they included me simply to balance out the radical Muslims. Do you know what the government wrote back to him? They said, here's what they said, he must renounce what he said even though he didn't say it. And then we might consider doing something along those lines. It's something right out of the ex-Soviet Union or something right out of Hitler Germany. They're telling me that I am guilty until proven innocent. My lawyer says to them, but he didn't say those things. And they're saying, well, we don't care, but we need him to renounce them anyway. This is frightening. We are living in a Soviet-like era under these radical liberals, and the people are finally waking up, I think. Well, they have to wake up. I'll tell you, I've got friends in England, some very good friends in England. I told them that until this stuff stops, I'm not setting foot there. It is unbelievable that you've been treated in this way, an American citizen who has the right to speak his mind, and they're more concerned with what radical Islamists think than what you what you think. They ought to open their ears and start listening to you, and if they did, they'd understand that what you're saying is the complete truth. Well, again, I don't want to drag the health care, which is really now a, a health insurance reform bill. Did you notice how the Democrats, Dr. Rosenblum, subtly changed it a few weeks ago from health reform to health insurance reform? What is it that they're after? Tell me if I'm wrong. I mean, you're the doctor, and I'm not that into the whole picture. I know basically what they're doing. The reason someone like Pelosi, who is one of the most horrendous human beings that has ever inhabited uh, the speaker's uh, chair... A monster. I've never seen anything like this. A pig out of Animal Farm. I don't know how I have any other words. These people are out of Animal Farm. They want everyone to cut, and they buy six new Gulfstream 550 jets so they can fly their fat behinds around the country with their children at my expense, and we're supposed to take this? Listen to this. This is driving me crazy. Why does Nancy Pelosi want health insurance reform? The only thing I can figure out is her cronies are going to get a big taste of the billions of insuring the American people. Uh, in Whether it's the Wall Street gang that's going to underwrite these, um, these insurance plans. What actually do you think they're after here with the money? I think that what they're after, Michael, is more is worse than that. I think to a certain extent they want to reward their cronies. And obviously, you know, uh, Obama has said nothing about tort reform. This is not even in the cards uh, because, you know, the uh, the Trial Lawyers Association is a big, a huge... Concern. Well, Obama should start with tort reform and rein in some of these left-wing women, but uh, I certainly would expect tort reform along with the tort reform. Of course, <laughs> But you know the thing the thing that they're after Michael is this is this is control of the government. If you look over what happened when Medicare was passed in 1965, you know people say, well we ought, we, we you know it's the free market system. No, it's the government intervention and destruction of the free market system that causes that has caused what we've got now. You know, it's uh, Medicare and Medicaid are the are the is they're the 800 pound gorillas and the independent insurance companies are the fleas on the 800 pound gorillas. Nothing could be done by them in the way that they do it if the government didn't want to create basically a create dependence that's what they want to do 
No, but I understand. But look, the financial end is the something we should keep focused on. Nothing is done in Washington unless money is taken off the top, unless people are rewarded. Unless people are siphoning off money, unless they're stealing the vig off the top, you got to think of this as an organized criminal enterprise. You got to think of the Sopranos. Why would the Sopranos, after taking over the United States government, want to grab the health insurance industry? That's the only thing you got to ask yourself. And if you wrote the script, you'd figure it out pretty quick that they're going to rob billions of dollars off the taxpayer's table simply to reward people who jump into the insurance business that they then grant the contracts to. That's what this is all about in my primitive understanding of it. Of course. It's about power and money, those two things. And it's that's all it's about. It's about making us dependent so they can have more power, and it's about manipulating the money for health care. You know, they talk about health care as being, uh, you know, 17% of the GNP, and they've got to do something about that. Well, government's 25% of the GNP. We ought to do something about that. There's an article out today, Hispanics watching health care debate closely because they make up the largest majority of the uninsured. It turns out that this is all about insuring the illegal alien. How in the world could this disgrace have come, out, uh, come to light and the people are not acting out on this? How in the world can they be demanding that we, the taxpayer, already taxed to death, support health care for illegal aliens? Well, it's unbelievable. I, I, I can't understand it. I think part of it is, you know, look, we've, we're a country that has our head in the sand. Most of the people do. They were educated after a time when the far-left liberals took over the education system. And they've been led as if they have a ring through their nose through this. And they just don't understand. The fact is, they're going to lose their country. Uh, it's, all, it's like the Visigoths moving into uh, the, uh, the Italian peninsula prior to the fall of Rome. They're, and this, in, in this case, the, Eastern, the Western Roman Empire. They're going to lose their country because as you say there's no language culture borders we're not having we're not having we're not talking about legal immigration this is illegal immigration they ought to be taken uh, taken to the border but here's I, obama in mexico today pandering to the illegal aliens in mexico and their families saying don't worry we'll give you health care reform even if we can't get immigration reform don't worry hang in there the man is answering to la raza he put the head of la raza cecilio muñoz into the white house they're running the country Dr. Rosenblum writes for the American thinker. He has just appeared on the Savage Nation. Dr. Rosenblum, any time you are so motivated to wish to call this program, uh, I would welcome you and give you a priority boarding pass. Thank you, Michael. I appreciate it. Please call me Frank. We're both, we both have doctorates. Let's not be formal. <laughs> okay, Dr. Rosenblum, thanks for being on the Savage Nation. I worked so hard for my degree. I uh, certainly respect the other people who have as well. I don't have an honorary degree, unlike uh, uh, some. Um, I'll be right back. Well, we're talking about health care reform. We're talking about the, the monsters that are behind Obama. This is the most radical left-wing regime America has ever seen. All of the crazies from the universities from the 60s onward are now running America's policy t uh, policies. They're now projecting their madness onto the American people, and the American people are fighting back, they're pushing back, they're acting out, because they finally understand the danger they are in. Whether it is uh, too little, too late, remains to be seen. I'll give you another example. I have a number of cars, one of which is a, a, a toy of mine. It's a 1965 Cadillac convertible with about 55,000 miles. I've had it since 1994. I got it the year I went into radio. I bought it used. It was in good shape. I've used this in a live performance once. I had it out on the stage at the Concord Pavilion. I drove out in it when the, when the uh, show began and honked the horn at a red light, got out and got out with the newspapers and started to do my bit based on the news. It was a very good stunt and a very good, uh, what shall I say, prop. And I love this car. Keep it in the garage. But I don't use it but once or twice a year. So I took it out about a month ago. I put it back in and it stank and stank and stank and stank. Now, I'm used to these old cars smelling for a few days, you know, usually a drip on a downpipe. This went on and on. So I smelled gas, went on, they didn't see any in the tank, near the tank, because I had the tank replaced five years ago. So now I just got a call from my mechanic, and he says, well, the old 65 Caddy, we found an oil leak, a cracked fuel line, and a differential leak. Now, what would old Ezekiel Emmanuel say? Withhold the repairs, kill the Cadillac? After all, it's a 1965, and it's had a good life until now? Let it go into the junkyard? And some days I wake up and I look at my dog, Teddy, my little 10-pound Teddy. What a useless dog he is. After all, he doesn't hunt. 
He doesn't fish. He's not a guard dog, per se. Would Rahm Emanuel and his good old brother Ezekiel, one day will we wake up and hear that we have to euthanize our dogs and cats? Because after all, they create such a high carbon footprint. Think about the amount of carbon that a dog or a cat puts out proportionate to its weight on the planet. Think about the amount of carbon that is required to make the dog food and make the packaging. Think about the amount of veterinary care that these poor animals need from time to time. Why, they're all decadent and they're all part of the capitalist excess. And so therefore the government under Obama and the Emanuels are going to ask you to turn your dog into the government veterinary care center so they can be euthanized to let other more useful dogs live. Perhaps mongrels from other countries that can be used in some way for the government to keep you controlled in the internment camp. Savage. You are listening to Michael Savage Archives on Really Big Something Channel. I would note that our common prosperity also depends on orderly legal migration. All three of our nations have been enriched by our ties of family and community. I think of my own brother-in-law who is Canadian. I think of the many Mexican-Americans from Jalisco who found home in Los Angeles and Texas and in my hometown of Chicago. Now we understand what Obama's all about and who put him in office. Why would this man now be in Mexico at a time like this? Why is he in Mexico promising the illegal aliens and their families a gold-plated medical system to which they are not entitled unless they put him in office? It's as though a foreign government has taken over America. Now, this is not limited to the United States of America. That is a foreign government taking over a country. In the United Kingdom, a foreign government has taken over England. They may be on the way out. The Tories or conservatives may be on the way in. But right now, a Soviet-era government is running the United Kingdom. As you know, this illegitimate government in England picked me out of a hat to balance out the radical Muslims who are threatening the very existence of England. And in order to make the Muslims feel better... They included Michael Savage, American talk show host, not for anything he had done, and not for anything he had actually said, but for sound bites that were provided to them by Media Matters and other minions of Hillary Clinton, so best as I can understand. So if you don't think that there's a conspiracy between the Obama administration and what happened to me, you're mistaken. And I'm going to tell you again, Limbaugh, you listen to me. Hannity, you listen to me. Hemorrhoids, you better listen to me. You are going to be next. I'm warning all of you. You may think that you're going to skate above this, but you're wrong. And it's time for you to put aside your petty jealousies of Michael Savage and join me, because you're going to be next. In the next few weeks, I'm going to call upon every listener to this show. After the Labor Day weekend, I'm going to do everything one man can do. I'm going to try to get the few rational Democrats, the few rational Republicans who are left in this country to uh, intervene on my behalf and get my name off this list of murderers and terrorists. Because your future freedom is at stake. Don't assume it's only about me. An article just came out in World Net Daily that you're not going to believe. It's up on michaelsavage.com under a different headline. It is something out of the ex-Soviet Union or something out of the ex-Nazi era in Germany. We have letters that we have produced and we're going to produce on this show that was sent to my lawyer that would make any American, liberal, Democrat, conservative, Republican, or independents, uh, stand up and say this can't be going on in the United States of America. The fact of the matter is, the British government has demanded that I renounce myself and things I have said, even though I have not said them. My lawyer emphasized that I did not make these statements. In fact, they cite the New Yorker profile of Michael Savage and show that when careful research is done about me, they find that I'm not the man that they thought I was. The government said, we don't care what you say. He must renounce himself in order to be possibly removed from the banned Britain government list. This is something that the Soviet Union specialized in. They would call in doctors. They would call in uh, authors. They would call in musicians. They'd call in engineers, they'd call in teachers. Anyone who opposed the Soviet system was called before a bureaucrat on the order of one of the Obama minions and told to repudiate their views, even if their views were rational, even if they were reasonable, even if they were orderly and made sense and not violent. 
The Soviets said, you have become an enemy of the state, you must repudiate your views, and then we might take you off the list. The minute the individual repudiated the views that they didn't even state, they were sent to a re-education camp. What this government in England is trying to do is get me to say I said these things, but I didn't. So they can then say, well, since you actually said them, which you just admitted, because you repudiated them, we're now going to keep you on the list forever with the murderers. Now you say, well, I'm sorry, Savage, but I could care less. We have bigger problems with Obama. Yes, you do, and yes, yes, you do, and I understand that. But somehow in the mix of all of what is going on, somehow with the meltdown of our freedoms and the meltdown of our medical system, the finest in the world, and these Cretans want to re-engineer re an entire system when they can't re-engineer a pencil, they want to take the finest medical system in the world, despite all of its warts, and destroy it and rebuild it in some image that they don't even know what, uh, what Frankenstein will emerge. I understand these problems are bigger than my own. But I can't be lost in the midst of this blizzard of troubles. I must be my own advocate. I must continue to remind you that my fight for freedom of speech is your fight for freedom of speech. We found in letters sent by the British government before they put my name on the list that there were individuals in the government itself who said we can't do this because we may be seen as duplicitous in that he didn't say any of these things. They went ahead anyway. Here's the uh, quote right now. I think we could be accused of duplicity in naming Savage. The internal email communications included a message from an unnamed civil servant whose cautions were ignored. He said, I think we could be accused of duplicity in naming Savage. But they went ahead anyway. In addition to this, the British Home Secretary has a press release that is still up which says that the controversial daily radio host has, has, has led others to commit serious criminal acts. Now you know that that's entirely false. Because had my freedom of speech led to criminal acts, I wouldn't be in radio for 15 years. I wouldn't have lasted this long. I would have been off the air. At no time has I ever have I ever provoked or sought to provoke others to commit crimes or serious criminal acts. Now, I've appealed to you to contribute to the Savage Legal Fund on michaelsavage.com. I want to remind you that I need your help now and I need it tomorrow. But more than your donations, I need you to keep this issue alive. Because come September, I am going to uh, a launch a public relations campaign to Congress. I'm going to ask the Republicans who still consider themselves fair. I'm going to ask the Blue Dog Democrats, who are very cognizant of the power of talk radio and their re-election desires, to get behind the, uh, the, the desire for Michael Savage to be uh, treated fairly. Remember, an innocent man has been condemned. You say, hey, what's the big deal? You're enjoying the publicity. That's a very cynical view, and I can understand it because I'm a cynical guy. But let me tell you something. If you know somebody who enjoys waking up in the middle of the night and trying to think about how he's going to get out of this thing, uh, if you think that I enjoy spending my every moment thinking about this, you're more cynical than I am, my friend. I wouldn't wish this on you. But I warn you, if we have a government now of Obama that has a Rahm Emanuel in it, who has a brother named Ezekiel Emanuel, who is on record writing things in medical journals over the years that should make anyone look up and say this can't be going on in America. How do you not suspect that this government under Obama was not duplicitous and not in conspiracy with the British government and having my name put on that list? After all, it was Hillary Clinton herself who boasted a few years ago that with George Soros's money, she created a group called Media Matters. Media Matters, as you well know, specializes in taking sound bites of Michael Savage, Rush Limbaugh, Bill O'Reilly, and other conservatives, and removing them from the context in which they are said in an attempt to hang the individual on false statements. And so, as I say, I'm first. I am the canary in the mine shaft. But Limbaugh being the egomaniac that he is, Hannity being the insecure infant that he is, uh, the hemorrhoid being the imbecile that he is, have done nothing because they don't understand the danger that they themselves are in.
But I'm going to play for you now the Hillary Clinton Media Matters clip if you think I'm making this up. Listen to it. Institutions that I help to start and support, like Media Matters and Center for American Progress, you know, we're beginning to match what I had said for okay, a Let's year. stop right there. So here she is on record saying that she helped create Media Matters. So when you understand that this picking of Michael Savage did not happen in a vacuum, that there is a there is collusion between the Obama administration and the far left socialist labor government of England. You understand that I'm not making these things up. That's what I think. Moreover, I've asked Hillary Clinton to intervene on my behalf. You say, well, that's absurd. It isn't absurd. She is the secretary of state for all American citizens. That means citizens she doesn't even agree with. Why is she so concerned with the human rights of illegal aliens? Why is Hillary Clinton so concerned about the human rights of Mexicans who are not even here legally, yet she has no concern for the human rights of Michael Savage? Why is that? I'll let you figure the two and two to here, and you'll come up with four. Now, let's go back to the uh, uh, health care debate, the health insurance reform debate, really, because the Obamaites are not really after health care reform. They're after grabbing the insurance industry and controlling it because there's trillions of dollars to be made over a 10-year period. Make no mistake about it, this is the Chicago gang at work. It has the Chicago hands all over it. There's an article from the New York Post by Betsy McAfee from July 24th called Deadly Doctors. So you say, well, it's the Post and they're a uh, tabloid and they make things up. Well, they quote Dr. Ezekiel Emanuel, the brother of White House Chief of Staff Ram Emanuel, who is now a health policy advisor at the OMB and a member of the Federal Council on so-called comparative effectiveness research, something again out of the Soviet, the ex-Soviet Union. And what Emanuel wrote should make every American frightened. He should be fired immediately. He should be thrown off the health care committees. This guy should be looked at with tremendous fear. These Emmanuel brothers are very, very, very dangerous brothers. I want you to read this. He wrote in the Journal of the American Medical Association, remember who this is. This is Barack Obama's chief of staff, Rahm Emanuel's brother, Ezekiel Emanuel. Two guys from wherever. Two little guys from wherever. And what the brother writes is this. He says, doctors take the Hippocratic Oath too seriously. Quote, as an imperative to do everything for the patient, regardless of the cost or effects on others. That's from JAMA, June 18, 2008. Emmanuel wants doctors to look beyond the needs of their patients, you hear, and consider social justice, such as whether the money could be better spent on somebody else. Emmanuel believes that communitarianism should be used to guide decisions. Communitarianism is a code word for communism. He said medical care should be reserved for the non-disabled. I'll repeat that. Emmanuel's brother says that medical care should be reserved for the non-disabled, not given to, quote, those who are irreversibly prevented from being or becoming participating citizens, close quote. He said that, and it was published in the Hastings Center Report, November, December, 1996. In The Lancet, a very serious medical journal from England, January 31st, first, the same Emmanuel defends discrimination against older patients. Here's what Emmanuel says, the communitarian, quote, Unlike allocation by sex or race, allocation by age is not invidious discrimination. Every person lives through different life stages rather than being a single age. Even if 25-year-olds receive priority over 65-year-olds, Everyone who was 65 years now was previously 25 years. So says Ezekiel Emanuel. And now you know why the Chicago gang wants to rush this through Congress. But you only know the part of it. You only know the, un, the inhuman part of it. What you're not seeing is the follow the dollar part of it. Because once they put the private insurance companies out of business... And once they get to, to uh, insure you with government insurance, you can guarantee that they'll manage it just as well as they manage the U.S. Post Office. And you can guarantee yourself that management of American health care under the Emanuel brothers and their minions 
will be as valuable as the U.S. dollar is since it's been taken off the gold standard. Every dollar, of course, is worth the paper it's printed on and nothing more. I can guarantee you that the health care system, once it is hijacked by these two brothers, will have the same value as a paper dollar. This is the Savage Nation. I'll take your calls. Savage. You know the jazz couldn't exist if Obama had been president for the last 30 years. There'd be no jazz. It probably would have been considered too innovative. It would have been too individualistic. Individualistic music, as you well know, goes against the communitarian view. What we need is bold state uh, music. Music that the state approves. Music that the state finds, well, non-threatening, after all. If it doesn't appeal to Nancy Pelosi's taste, it couldn't be good music. Now, I don't know whether or not she approves or disapproves of jazz. I know that she disapproves of anyone who goes to public meetings and actually uh, turns it into a town hall meeting by speaking out. She says that that is un-American. I'm quoting her right now from the USA uh, uh, Away mag uh, newspaper. I call it USA Away since it's never made a nickel. Nobody even knows who funds it. Nobody knows how it exists if it's always lost money. But the newspaper USA Away quotes Nancy Pelosi and Steny Hoyer uh, saying that anyone who goes to a town hall meeting and speaks out is un-American. Now, what's interesting to me is a while back, Hillary Clinton made a statement about such un-American behavior, which I'd like you to listen to. Go ahead, play the I Hillary am piece. sick and tired of people who say that if you debate and you disagree with this administration, somehow you're not patriotic, and we should stand up and say we are Americans and we have a right to debate and disagree with any administration. Even a clock is right twice a day. I mean, I have to agree with her. And uh, I totally agree with her. We should have a right to speak out. And I don't think it's un-American, Nancy, to speak out at a town hall meeting. Of course, what kind of town hall meeting the Democrats are used to is the type the Soviets used to run in the ex-Soviet Union, where a member of the Politburo would go in and anyone who spoke was pre-selected, as you have in the Washington Press Corps where, where the men without private parts congregate and the women in uh, uh, whatever. Uh, where the boys with kilts congregate with pancake makeup, and if Obama appears, they practically get on the hands and knees. That's the kind of Soviet press we have today. Savage. We come to believe that the dizzy ones are running America. Health insurance reform is what they call it now. No longer health care reform. Now it's health insurance reform. Mammograms. They're promising you regular checkups and tests and mammograms. If only you'll sign on the dotted line. Now, it may be true that you'll get a free mammogram from uh, big, uh, big medicine. And uh, I doubt uh, very much that they would not want to give you a regular checkup because that way they can check up on you regularly and see if you're a regular citizen. You must get a regular checkup from Obama's government health plan because that way they can see if you're a regular citizen or you're doing something wrong. How better to keep a check on the citizens than to have them come into your office for a mandatory regular checkup? That way they can monitor your blood, they can monitor your looks, and they can see if you're a good Purdue chicken uh, still useful in the coop. Because if you're no longer useful to the coop, according to the communitarianism system, communitarianism system that uh, Ezekiel Emanuel believes in, why then that chicken must be ejected from the coop. You see, uh, old Ezekiel Emanuel uh, has spoken out and written out and quite a bit now, and it came up in an article in the New York Post July 24th called Deadly Doctors by Betsy McAfee. And in this, it's clear that he wants to ration care and cut it off for the disabled. Emanuel wants doctors to look beyond the needs of their patients and to consider social justice, such as whether the money could be better spent on somebody else, such as... Uh, an illegal alien. See, a young illegal alien has many years ahead of her, her or him. doesn't matter whether they're a citizen because we're all humans, according to Ezekiel Emanuel. Now, it could be that there's an American who fought in World War II, who's now 85, who has dementia. But according to Ezekiel Emanuel, he shouldn't get care for his uh, dementia. Or perhaps he fought in World War II and he has Parkinson's. Well, he's had a good life, according to the communitarianism system. And it's time to move him out of the coop. And make room for the illegal alien five years old. Because they have a, a much more useful lifespan ahead for the communitarians who will be ordering future orders of uh, Gulfstream 550s. In fact, by the time that five-year-old illegal alien from Mexico is 
15, Nancy Pelosi may have a Gulfstream 750. She may be older, but she'll still need a fleet of Gulfstream 700s to fly her, her and her family uh, around in order to make certain that she can do more good for more uh, more people. And then, of course, you understand that the talk shows have to go. They won't do that right up front, nor will they do it in a head-on assault because they know that they'll hit a stone wall. So what they do is first they go to their communist friends in England and they say, look, you're putting together a list of Muslims who should be banned from the country because they want to destroy England, they want to convert you. Uh, some of them, in fact, were in jail for 10 years for having killed uh, uh, immigrants. Throw Michael Savage's name into that mix, too, so that when we come after him on trumped-up charges, we can use the evidence that you banned them, that he's not a good person at all. And, of course, Jackie Smith went ahead and said, okay, he's a bad person, he's on the list. So now my lawyer writes to them and says he never said these things, and they say, well, he needs to repudiate what he said anyway. So the lawyers go back back and forth now, letter after letter after letter, and say, he never said these things. These are taken out of context by the Stalinist group Media Matters, funded by George Soros. Hillary Clinton wanted Media Matters to exist so they could skewer conservatives and put them out of business, even though that blowhard egomaniac Limbaugh won't lift the golf club, even though Wallbanger won't lift the hammer, and even though the hemorrhoid won't lift any preparation H, I keep on fighting. I keep on fighting with your help. And after Labor Day, I'm going to do a direct appeal to every member of Congress. And I know they're busy, but a terrible injustice has been done. My name must come off that list. My name will come off that list, whether it's in a court of law or when the conservatives take office. I want it done sooner rather than later, because every day my name stays in that list, the more dangerous it becomes for me and for everybody else. I know that the dark forces in the Obama administration who set this up and set me up are planning their next move. And I know that they're going to cite what England did to make their move against me in America and try to get me off the radio. I can guarantee that they're going to do this. Unfortunately for them, the New Yorker article came out a week ago. And the New Yorker article was so carefully researched and so well written that my lawyer wrote to the United Kingdom government and said, wait a minute now. The author of the New Yorker article, it, I forget how he put it. I wish I had the letter in front of me. I, hold on. Play music for a minute. I'm going to go look for it. Play any kind of music. i got to find a letter. I don't want to botch his words. I have it. I have it. I have it. just came back from the doctor, but my head is still working, even though they removed the barnacle from my back without any anesthesia and then sanded it off. She said, do you want any anesthesia for me to spray your head with that stuff to remove the cancers? Uh, there are six of them today. I said, no, I'm going to take it without anything. And I used the technique I learned a long time ago, which is to just compress my left hand as tight as I can and put all of the pain in my left hand, and guess what? I felt nothing. It was like self-hypnosis. I started to scream, I am Zeus. She got a kick out of that. As she sprayed away and cut away, I was screaming as loud as I could in the office, I am Zarathustra. <laughs> she got a kick out of that one. I never felt better. See, as we get older, we get stronger. The reason we get stronger when we get older is because we have more challenges ahead of us than we ever had in our life. You young people don't know that. You think that when you get older, you have less challenges. Oh, yes, I know. You go on vacations and you play golf. Well, not this one. Not this American boy. I don't go on vacations and play golf. Nothing wrong with that, of course. I wish you good luck if you like to go on vacations and play golf. Everyone needs some fun. But I realize that there's some tough sledding ahead. And so I have to make myself stronger rather than get weaker. Instead of getting ready for a time, I'm getting ready for a bigger battle than ever. And so here, I believe, is the letter. Oh, no, this is the old one. Eh, I can't find it. Does he quote the New Yorker? No, it didn't come out yet. I think he said, here it is. I got it. Thank you. So my lawyer writes to the, the jerk in the English government, the petty bureaucrat from the Soviet era, or someone who could have happily worked for Goering in Hitler, Germany with one of the wonderful bureaus that the Germans had, good, careful record-keeping. You know, the Germans were very good record-keepers, and there was universal health care in Germany, except for Jews, gypsies, communists, uh, and the handicapped. They, first, they wanted to euthanize all the handicapped because they were communitarians, and they realized that the, the, the better good for the most people would require that they get rid of the handicapped and kill them. After all, a handicapped person is no use to the Hitler Youth Corps, and you need a good, productive citizen, so you'll bring in as many as you can from Mexico. Now, it is true that one 
the one little fly in the ointment for Obama in Mexico today is that although he talks about uh, the wonders of Mexico and Mexican people and how much we've all gained, how we've been enriched by... Play clip five for a minute. I'll get back to the main theme. I would note that our common prosperity also depends on orderly legal migration. All three of our nations have been enriched by our ties of family and community. All right, yeah, all right, you mean, you, well, hold it. You mean all three of some people in your nations have been enriched by your ties of familia and community. There's no question about that. But the enrichment hasn't exactly spread to the average person. They've destroyed our health care system. They've destroyed our school system. They're destroying our prison system. They're destroying our legal system. One out of three prisoners is an illegal alien. So, you know, you may say that this is un-American of me to point out facts. You can call me a demagogue. But I would say that Obama's the demagogue by lying. Who's the demagogue here? Him? The president who lies about the enrichment of our ties to Mexico? Or Michael Savage who points out that one out of three prisoners is an illegal alien? Who's the demagogue here? You don't like my accent? What's the matter? You don't like my accent because I'm from the Bronx? What's the matter? You don't like my accent because I'm from the Bronx? What's the matter? You don't like my accent? Well, I, you know what I like to say to you? I can't say it on the radio. I almost said it. I almost said it because I ate too much eggplant last night. <laughs> Being in an Italian restaurant, you start to gesticulate with the two hands together. So on page three of my lawyer's letter to England... They quote the New Yorker article. So here's what my lawyer says to the bureaucrat in England. We also wish to draw your attention to a profile of our client, meaning Savage, which was published in the August 3rd edition of the New Yorker magazine recently, a copy of which we attached. As you will be aware, the New Yorker is one of the most respected magazines in the world and has over the years prof profiled many acclaimed artists, writers, and actors. We also invite you to listen to the audio interview with the author of the article, Mr. K. Senna, Senna, on the New Yorker website at the following URL. Now he goes on. Mr. Senna's article has already received positive feedback for the New Yorker readership. See, for example, the attached posting on the website by a Mr. Blake Eskin, a copy of which we also attached. Now here comes the punchline. My lawyer again to the UK communists who put me on the ban list. Mr. S. is, a, is plainly independent and politically no natural supporter of the views of our client. What a lawyer I have. I mean, he's brilliant. Mr. S. is plainly independent, he writes, and politically no natural supporter of the views of our client. Nonetheless, he has taken the trouble, he has taken to trouble, to carry out detailed research about Savage and form the balanced view. This is wholly different to the approach of the Home Office in selecting a few random extracts of what our client has stated out of context, from which it has formed a deeply misleading impression of our client. As stated by Mr. Sanna in his article, quote, the immoderate quotes meticulously cataloged by the liberal media watchdog site, MediaMatters.org, are accurate but misleading insofar as they reduce a willfully erratic broadcast to a series of political brickbats, close quote. In the letter, my lawyer also asks them why they didn't inform me that I was going to be on this list prior to putting my name on the list, especially when some of the people who reviewed the material in advance said, we'll be seen as duplicitous, he's never proposed violence. It's in emails. They said, why are you putting him on the list? Why didn't you tell him you're going to put him on the list? Why are you going to do this to him? You're going to humiliate him. You're going to uh, hurt him professionally. This is in emails now, internal emails. They, they say to my lawyer, we did so because we couldn't find his address. So my lawyer says, you couldn't find an address for Michael Savage, the third most popular radio host in the United States of America, but you could find sound bites of this client. Where'd you get the sound bites from? Ladies and gentlemen, if this case doesn't end soon, I am guaranteeing you as I sit here, as my dog is sitting below me, the oily tracks run all the way to Washington. Los Angeles, Liam, you're on the Savage Nation. Go ahead, please. Hey, Michael, I really feel for you. I've been there myself with this type of legal battle. Um, this is how they work, Michael. I'm a public school teacher who had the nerve to speak out about uh, an administration that was taking trips to China and uh, hiring uh, consulting firms and then turning around and giving them jobs. And then all of a sudden, I forgot how to teach, and they started building a case against me and harassing me. You're going through... 
uh, the same thing a, a, a thousand times worse. Well, and, I don't want to make your case less than mine or my case bigger than yours, but having an entire government against you, Liam, is pretty awesome. And it's formidable and very expensive. And I thank you for uh, uh, sharing. Let's go to Marie in New York City on WOR. Marie, welcome to the Savage Nation. Michael, I am very upset you were belittling yourself, saying your problem isn't as big as our bigger problems. Your problem is a part of our bigger problems. Haven't we all just been censured by the head commissar himself against speaking out against what he believes? And yes. I no, these are, these are fascists. This Obama administration is filled with fascist dictators of the lowest order. These Emmanuel brothers, Nancy Pelosi, these are dictators, all of them, every last one of them. They're criminals. They're telling us we can't speak out, that we're un-American. I ate a lot of eggplant last night. I'd like to tell you what gesture I'd like to say to them right now. I'd like to give them all a Bronx cheer and tell them what they can do. They can kiss my Bronx behind. I want to thank you for keeping us updated on the machinations of the Brothers Mengele. Oh, boy. No, you mean the Brothers Emmanuel, don't you? Not the Brothers Mengele. Yeah, I've been calling them Mengele for a long time now. No, Mengele, of course, euthanized uh, 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 Jewish prisoners after experimenting on them. You're not accusing them of doing that, are you? Well, at least not yet. Now they just say they should be denied care. I realize they could be of some use, though. When you actually think about it, to the communitarian view, after they deny medical care to those with cerebral palsy, they could say, now, wait a minute, there may be some use for them. We could use them in live experiments. You're right about that. Yes, I'm sitting I didn't here. think th I didn't think it through. I'm sorry, because after all, they're saying they should deny medical care to the useless citizens and pre and reserve it only for useful citizens. But in that way, if you were to take somebody with cerebral palsy, by their thinking, you could make them a useful citizen. In that, either you could make them give up organs that are still good, that would make them useful, wouldn't it? Exactly. Or they could do some live experiments on them to see how much pain they could experience or see how long they could take a dip in ice water the way the, the, the German doctors did. After all, that turned the undesirables into desirables, didn't it? I'm how did we fall this far, Marie, that people of this low psychotic mentality could be in such high places? Because from my point of view, they're psychotic. These men are very dangerous. These men are evil, and they're psychotic, in my opinion. You want to talk about un-American? They're un-American. How's that? Does that work for you, Marie? I'm a psychologist. It is my opinion they are psychotic, every one of them, as far yes. as I'm concerned. When I watch Obama speak, I see a narcissist who is not borderline psychotic. I see an absolute overt psychotic who is so in love with himself, he has no idea. He hasn't any idea what he is doing or where he's doing it. Why is he in Mexico today giving a speech about so-called health care reform to illegal aliens and their controllers in Mexico? Why is he in Mexico today? Tell me. You said it before. He's like because he's doing a town hall meeting in the town that elected him. I'll be right back. I would anticipate that before the year is out, we will have draft legislation, uh, along with sponsors potentially in the House and the Senate, who are ready to move this forward. And when we come back next year, uh, that we should be in a position to start uh, acting. Now, am I going to be able to uh, snap my fingers and get this done? No. This is going to be difficult. It's going to require bipartisan cooperation. There are going to be demagogues out there who try to uh, suggest that any form of uh, pathway for legalization for those who are already in the United States uh, is uh, unacceptable. And okay, so that's Obama in Mexico speaking to the people who put him in power, the illegal aliens and their controllers, saying that anyone who opposes illegal immigration now is a demagogue who should be on perhaps the home, Homeland Security watch list. So now it's gone from returning military veterans, anyone who's anti-abortion, uh, anybody who opposes homosexual marriage, and now anybody who opposes illegal immigration is now a potential demagogue according to the Obama psychotics because if you are an American who believes in borders language and culture by definition you're psychotic and a demagogue and that you're a dangerous person and the important thing is to make certain that the illegal aliens are treated better than you are now how did this happen that we awaken one day and we have a president 
speaking in a foreign country that exports one-fifth of its citizens to suck off the land in America. Make no mistake about it. They're not a net contributor to this society. Uh, I think the number is $25 billion are known to go back to Mexico every year. So how does that help you if they send $25 billion back? Well, first of all, that money should be taxed, number one. It's money under the table. So they're not paying taxes. They're not paying Social Security. They're getting free medical care, free legal care. God knows what else they're getting for free. And so, therefore, now he's representing them against you, the Native American citizen who does not want any more illegal sucking the system dry? How do we have an administration? And by the way, it's no different than Bush. Make no mistake about it. Bush also went with the guys with the big hats. Make no mistake about it. Bush also handed to the man with the big hat on the big white horse. Savage. You are listening to Michael Savage Archives on Really Big Something Channel. I now want to talk about the communist revolution going on in America. And make no mistake about it, we're going through an early phase of a communist revolution. I know it sounds abrupt. I know it sounds unrealistic because you haven't read it in your local paper. But listen carefully. After the end of World War I, Germany was a defeated nation. It had been beaten militarily. Its people were starving because of a continued Allied blockade. And Germany was in shambles. At this moment, the communists took advantage of the situation to go on strike. The year before, Lenin had conducted a successful revolution in Russia, and Germany was the next target. The Communist Party of Germany, also known as the Spartacist Bund, staged massive street demonstrations designed to destabilize the government. They called a general strike in January of 1918 and filled the streets of Berlin with half a million of their communist foot soldiers. Eventually, order was restored because conservatives, centrists, and returning war veterans known as the Free Corps, put down the communist revolution. Now remember, this was before Hitler's rise to power. These were not Nazis. These were ex-soldiers who didn't want to see their country destroyed by the red menace of communism. Now, let's think about who today's... Let's think about who today in America fears returning war veterans. I seem to remember that returning war veterans were on the list of those to be watched as potential right-wing extremists by none other than Janet Napolitano, who heads up the Homeland Security Department. But who else was put on this list to be watched? Anti-abortion activists, people opposed to same-sex marriage, militia members, gun control opponents, people concerned about the loss of manufacturing jobs, those opposed to illegal immigration. All of you became enemies of the Obama administration. Let's go back to Germany, World War I. The communist revolution in Germany, where there were communist street thugs beating people up, only came to an end when the right wing stood up and fought back. Much later, a leader of the extreme right wing then appeared, and his name, Adolf Hitler. Unfortunately for the world, he was not a real conservative. He was a Nazi. He was a racist. He was a murderer. Let's be very clear. The, Nazi, the conservative movement is not the Nazi movement. The conservative movement is not run by Adolf Hitler. But we need the conservative movement and we need a conservative leader. We must not let the communist left, Boxer, Reed, Feinstein, Obama, Napolitano, determine what is conservative and what is patriotic. They are absolute textbook Marxists. They meet every definition of such. We now see a communist revolution occurring in the United States of America. The only thing happening is that the people themselves, the average person, without any leadership whatsoever from the Republicans or conservative leadership, are awakening to the dictatorship that is emerging under Chairman Obama. They are starting to appear at town hall meetings, and they're yelling out, shouting out, talking out, walking out, speaking out. Strangely enough, this is occurring without any conservative leadership from the political establishment whatsoever. To counter this, though, the communists under Obama are now bringing out union thugs to beat up average American citizens. I've just given you a thumbnail sketch of the communist revolution that almost occurred in Germany and the communist revolution that is occurring in America. This is the savage nation. All right, play the clip. He has the right to be represented. I'm his father and I want to talk to you face to face. Under the Obama health care plan which you support, this man would be given no care whatsoever because he is a cerebral palsy handicapped person.
Listen, we put an amendment in which will address his specific problem as the bill was going to... That was the sound, that was the voice of a father who went to a town hall meeting with Congressman Dingell. Dingell got up there to do the normal dog and pony fake town hall meeting. This man has a, a, a an adult son with uh, cerebral, cerebral palsy. The man got up and demanded answers from Dingell, and Dingell gave him the finger, basically. And Nancy Pelosi says that it is un-American to talk to your congressman honestly. Nancy Pelosi says it is un-American for a town hall meeting to actually have people from the town in the hall. Nancy Pelosi says it is un-American for anyone to speak at a town hall meeting, except Nancy Pelosi and those who want six Gulfstream 550 jets in every uh, pot. This is the Savage Nation. We're going to talk about health care reform, how this is the Waterloo for the Democrat Party, how they're finally meeting the people and finding out that enough is enough, that Obama's been exposed for the neo-Marxist fraud that he is. And speaking of Obama, here we have a country that's going up in smoke, and he goes to Guadalajara, Mexico, and promises the illegal aliens that he's going to give them health care. I don't think you understand the subtext of this entire so-called health insurance debate. It is about making certain that Obama's friends in La Raza are rewarded for having brought out the illegal alien vote for him. It is about granting health care to non-citizens. It is about bankrupting the American health care system along with everything else in order to make certain that the illegal aliens primarily from Mexico and all of their relatives get a gold-plated medical care system. We can talk about that as well. Now, we're going to talk about the health insurance reform bill that is in the works because the Democrat liars have changed it from a health care bill to a health insurance reform bill. What they really want to do is make certain that the government becomes the master insurer. Now, why would the government want to be the master insurer? For the same reason we have a Federal Reserve that insures our currency. Now, you know what a great job the Federal Reserve has done in insuring the value of our currency Without a gold standard, without a silver standard, there is no standard. They're printing paper. And it's the same with health insurance reform. They want to make certain that they can hold the paper. And think of the billions of dollars that are going to be made by Pelosi's friends who are suddenly going to pop up to provide the insurance for the government. Think about the underwriting that Wall Street is going to get out of this. Think about all of the collateral fortunes that are going to be made from these uh, uh, health insurance reform bills that is circulating right now. I'll be right back. Savage. The so-called unrest in Honduras is considered a problem. Well, what is it about? Well, the people of Honduras have acted. They threw out a dictator. But once again, our administration has chosen the side of a socialist dictator over the will of the people. This is a shocker. Joining us now to discuss what's going on in Honduras and why Obama's on the side of the communists is Ray Walser from the Heritage Foundation. Thanks, Michael, for uh, letting me uh, talk with you this afternoon about uh, the situation in Honduras. Uh, many of you may have read that on June 28th, it's now been over a month, the good citizens of Honduras, a small Central American state, removed their president, Manuel Zelaya, sent him into exile. And what we've seen is a ongoing effort on the part of the United States, of others, to restore Mr. Zelaya to presidential office in Honduras. And that situation continues without let up, without a solution in sight to this very day. Give us a little background on Honduras and what's going on there now. Honduras, as most of you know, is a, is a Central American state uh, with a population of a, roughly about 7 million. It's very poor. It's one of the poorest countries uh, in the hemisphere. Uh, it is closely tied, for a number of reasons, uh, with the United States. Those ties include trade relations. We're their biggest client, the purchaser of their agricultural goods. They have a lot of textile plants that we put in with foreign investment. They benefit from a free trade agreement called CAFTA. Uh, so there's a strong business class that's oriented towards the U.S. Uh, Honduras produces a large number of immigrants to the United States. Uh, given its impoverished conditions, they send back lots of remittances or monies to their home country, which has helped at least get uh, a number of people out of poverty. It's a country, uh, as I said, 
in which 60 to 70 percent of the population lives uh, in poverty, uh, and there is a middle class and a, and a small upper class. Uh, in the past, particularly in the 1980s, Honduras allied with the United States. It was the uh, area, the staging area from which the Contras, who were fighting uh, the communist uh, Sandinistas in Nicaragua, uh, <clears throat> had used as their base and their sort of resupply area, rest area, and so forth and so on. Well, the Central American Wars ended in the, in the 1990s. Honduras sort of settled down into a sort of mediocre, uh, poor, but democratic country, uh, largely dominated by two political parties. In 2005, they elected a gentleman from the Liberal Party, Manuel Zelaya, who was a wealthy rancher, not considered to be particularly have a strong political agenda. But over time, Zelaya began to look around, began to see that he was not making much headway against poverty, not able to deal with the problems of economic growth, with crime, which have beset uh, Honduras. And he began to gravitate towards Hugo Chavez, Chavez of Venezuela. Chavez had things to offer. Chavez had oil uh, resources. He had aid. So in other words, as Zelaya looked around, he could turn to Chavez for growing assistance. So a couple, about a year ago, he joined a, a thing that's called ALBA, which is the Chavez Bolivarian uh, Alternative for the Americas. It's an alliance that brings together countries such as Cuba, Venezuela, uh, Bolivia, and to this Nicaragua under Daniel Ortega, uh, and Honduras also joined in this political association. Well, tell us about this new political club. Well, this political club is pro-left, anti-U.S., and increasingly inclined towards what you'd call confrontational or polarizing uh, politics. It wants to basically break down the a conservative state like Honduras, isolate the, uh, the middle class and the, the more well-to-do, and create a base uh, largely among the poor. Build a political base, rewrite the Constitution, uh, and basically gravitate towards this sort of left uh, Cuban-Venezuelan socialist program. Well, this is what Zelaya bought into. And he began to launch an effort to change the Constitution. He began with the, uh, what he called, he was going to hold a poll querying the people to see if they wanted to have a referendum on the Constitution. But everybody knew what he was trying to do. He was basically trying to alter the, uh, the Constitution of Honduras. And it was pretty transparent that his goal was to have a referendum, alter the Constitution, and allow him... Uh, to stay in power. Well, the institutions of the state, the Congress, uh, the Supreme Court, the Electoral Tribunal, even the military disapproved of this. So in the week leading up to the instance of June 28th, Zelaya ran into increasing confrontation with the institutions of his own state. In other words, the system of checks and balances. He said, it doesn't count. I have the people behind me. I'm going to make a very. I'm going to make this sort of fundamental change. Therefore, I'm going to override the opinion of the Supreme Court. I'm going to ignore my Congress. I'm going to hold my referendum, and I don't care what happens because I want to have my way. And in essence, what happened on June 28th is, well, the Supreme Court, the military, the Congress all said, "You've gone too far." They rounded him up. They kicked him out of. They expelled him out of the country. This was done after the Supreme Court had basically stripped him of his powers according to the Constitution. Well, our media is playing this up as a military coup. It was not a military coup because the military is not running the country. It is providing uh, support and uh, maintains public order. Uh, the successor was the next in line, uh, who was the speaker, more or less, of the Congress. He steps forward, forms a new government. Zelaya's people are out. And that's, in essence, um, that was the situation on June 28th. And that's roughly where we stand uh, today. What has happened is that the international community, not recognizing the, the internal complications, not recognizing that Zelaya had uh, very flagrantly violated the constitution of his own country, have sided largely with Zelaya, saying that he is, uh, he was 
illegally overthrown. This is a violation of uh, the Inter-American Democratic Charter. The OAS has demanded as, that he be returned. No government has recognized the government of Robert uh, Michelete, which is uh, currently uh, in Tegucigalpa, which is the capital of Honduras. So a lot of external pressure, including pressure from the United States, is being brought upon the what they call the de facto government of Micheletti, uh, to return Zelaya. Well, this put our administration in a very awkward situation. Now, this is an awkward sort of situation for the U.S., because here you have Zelaya being supported very vigorously by Hugo Chavez, who even at one point threatened war, has used his aircraft to try to force Zelaya back into the country, seems to have any you know, basic disregard for civil order. Raul Castro has uh, has piped in and demanded that uh, Zelaya be returned because the democratic rights of the people of Honduras have been violated by this coup, uh, and the United States also siding with, with Zelaya. The one sort of change that has taken place a couple of weeks ago, or about three weeks ago, was the introduction of a mediator, the president of Costa Rica, another small Central American state, Nobel Prize winner Oscar Arias. He's been trying to broker some sort of deal that would allow Zelaya to return, probably under sort of conditioned, a uh, state of conditionality. But at this point, there is no agreement uh, among the parties and a very strong reluctance on the part of the Micheletti government, the Supreme Court, to allow Zelaya to return. So here we are at this, at this point. Uh, a month into the coup, uh, or into the constitutional change, uh, in something of a state of a stalemate. Uh, as of today, Zelaya is up talking to uh, President Calderon of Mexico. OAS envoys have once again visited Tegucigalpa. So there are ongoing conversations. The Arias mediation process is not completely at an end. But it is difficult. The, the sides have hardened. And it's very difficult to see uh, grounds at this point for compromise uh, between the forces of Zelaya and the forces which are the constitutionally based government in, uh, in Tegucigalpa. And that pretty much, hopefully in a nutshell, I know it's pretty complicated, uh, explains the situation that is going on uh, in Honduras at this point. Ray Walser, thanks for the information and thanks for being on the Savage Nation. Savage. Here's what uh, some of the articles on michaelsavage.com, you're not going to believe it. But Nancy Pelosi, the dictator, is calling town hall protesters simply un-American. Can you imagine that you're living in a country where people finally are speaking out and going to real town hall meetings and these communist dictators, these Leninist Dictators like Pelosi and Hoyer and the other Democrats are calling average Americans un-American. I guess a real town hall meeting would one would be the type that Nancy Pelosi can orchestrate with questions and answers, the kind of stuff that Obama gets away with. Now, I know a little bit about health care for a number of reasons. A, I'm an American. I'm over 60. I go to the doctor. Today, I went to the dermatologist to have certain things removed. I pay for it. I pay for my own health care plan. When I was young and I didn't have any money, I had to pay for my own health care, my children's health care. Go back to the last generation. My father was the sole bread, bread, uh, breadwinner in the family, immigrant, immigrant family. Father got a heart attack. I was in college. Guess what? Guess who paid for it? Nobody. I had to leave college for a semester to help run a store. What happened to me as a result? Nothing. I graduated six months later. Did it end my life? No, it made me stronger. So what? Would I need uh, Uncle Uncle Sam to pay for it? Well, I guess if Uncle Sam was willing to pay for it, uh, fine, it would have been great. But Uncle Sam wasn't willing to pay for it. Did it ruin my family? No. I don't want to hear that there's no way for poor people to take care of themselves. They took care of themselves for centuries before Danny Hoss, uh, Nancy Pelosi came along. So I go to the dermatologist and I pay for it myself. I go in there today. I have certain spots on my skin after all of the years of being around. And she says, well, you got a barnacle on your back. She says, please lie down on your stomach. She says, this will only hurt for a moment. She takes out the scalpel and it only hurt for a moment. And then I heard a scraping sound on my back. And I said, doctor, what are you doing? She said, I'm sanding 
the base of the barnacle off. I said, who is going to do the varnishing? The guy who does my boat? Well, it was a nice uh, joke. And then, of course, she had to spray my face with the hot, the cold stuff, which I have done every six months, because of the years that I indulged the sun. As you well know, the sun is your enemy. On the right side of michaelsavage.com is a video on a town hall protester who has been threatened. He visited Congressman Dingell and verbally, verbally and loudly declared that he is concerned that his child, who is very ill, will not get proper care under Obamacare. In fact, he was citing an article which said that decisions will be made so that some children such as his with muscular dystrophy might have to be, uh, let us say, euthanized by the government. He was visited in the middle of the night by Union thugs. Welcome to Stalin's America. Don't miss the picture of Al Franken as the horse's ass. And it goes with my new words, obotomy and obotomize, which I'm sure you've heard by now from the hemorrhoid with ears. Now, the White House claims that protests against health care have been scripted. But the stubborn reality is that polling on the matter shows that most Americans agree with the protesters. Obama is a neo-Marxist dictator. He is surrounded by gang members. Make no mistake about it. Now, if you go down on the list, you, you must read Britain's ban on Michael Savage. Something new has occurred. You may have heard that emails that my lawyers got from the British government under the Freedom of Information Act shows that officials who ban me from the country on uh, ban me strictly on racial grounds to balance out the Muslim terrorists on the list. It gets even worse. In their latest letter to me, it is something out of Stalin's playbook. They ask me to repudiate what I did not say. It's unbelievable, ladies and gentlemen. I am twisting in the wind while Rush... Hannity and the hemorrhoid do nothing. This is the savage nation. And by the way, there's another article you mustn't miss. The illegal aliens want Democrat health reform, and that's what it's all about. This entire health reform debate spins around the Mexicans who want free care for six, eight, ten relatives, and they're not even citizens. You won't believe this, but you got to read the story. The Democrats may as well be working for a foreign government. That's it for now from michaelsavage.com. Uh, I want to talk about the absurdity of, of, of health and preventative health, uh, the, the, the conflicting, the conflicting uh, uh, opinions that you get. For years you were told, stay out of the sun, it will kill you. And it's probably a good idea to stay out of the sun, it will kill you. Now all of a sudden, the uh, doctor freaks are telling you to get as much vitamin D as you can or you're going to die. As a That's the latest hula hoop in the medical profession. They've all discovered vitamin D deficiency. You don't need vitamin C, you don't need vitamin E, you don't need B6, you don't need pyridoxine, you don't need riboflavin, you don't need niacin, you don't need vitamin E. They've all been proven no good, but listen to your doctor quack. He tells you to get as much vitamin D as you can. They don't know what the hell they're talking about, most of them. But the fact of the matter is, it's conflicting with stay out of the sun. I will tell you that preventive medicine is the most important thing that you can engage in trying to prevent disease before it occurs. Now, you're not, only going to be, you're not always going to be successful at that, obviously, but uh, food is the best medicine, as you well know. And I've written books on this going back to 19... God, it's a long time ago, 1972, Earth Medicine, Earth Foods, Macmillan Publishing. 1972, so I've been at this area, in this uh, uh, realm of study, for a very long period of time. And traditional cultures have long advised people on how to eat, well in order to live well it's only in our culture where the doctors and the food establishment lie to the people tell them to eat the oreos tell them to go have the hot dogs tell them to go have the cheeseburgers tell them to go have the fatty meals and take a cholesterol pill and there there you'll be fine so the quacks with stethoscopes continue their lies they tell you to poison your arteries they tell you to poison your skin and then they tell you to take a little pill and continue to poison yourself all of the health insurance reform in the world is not going to lower costs unless the people become proactive uh, in their own health. And so I say to you, food is the best medicine, and you should arm yourself with the best knowledge. And I hardly recommend healing children naturally, which can only be found on michaelsavage.com. I wrote it in 1982. I republished it last year. 
It's still the best book ever written on diet and nutrition for children and prospective parents. Now, speaking about food being the best medicine, I'm also a man who loves eating and food. And last night, I got to tell you, I had the best eggplant in the world at my friend Lorenzo's North Beach restaurant. Now, this is not so much a plug as it is to tell you that when you go in there next time, you say to him, I want the savage eggplant. Now, what is the savage eggplant? Why? It's not even on the menu. It should be Lorenzo, but okay, I won't even charge you for it. Let me explain why I'm mentioning the savage eggplant. I love eggplant. Years ago, I read that the black skin of the eggplant is extremely protective against various skin conditions, including early stages of skin cancer. Now, of course, the studies are uh, not pronouncedly uh, advanced to the extent that you could say this definitively to be true. But there is evidence to suggest that some of these folkloric claims have validity. And I tend to believe that many folkloric claims do have great validity in the sense that uh, when I was an anthropology graduate student a long time ago, I learned that the reason folk uh, remedies continue to persist down through the ages is because they work. And I learned also that folk tales persist from generation to generation because there is some truth in them. And the folk tales that have no truth disappear in time and so therefore i eat a lot of eggplant but i'll tell you something you try to get eggplant cooked properly it's almost impossible it's a very difficult dish to cook properly i get it for example my my savage eggplant is cooked perfectly it has no cheese on it and it's covered in a pomodoro sauce it's unbelievable it's perfect and the reason i eat it without cheese is because i'm on a no dairy diet i'm going to talk about that for a minute why am i on a no dairy diet Because I found, although I had incredibly great health, thus far to this stage of my life I've had no surgery, I'm on no medication. Would you believe it? Most people my age are on seven medications, and they want Uncle Uncle Schmuck to pay for every medication. And, of course, the doctor is very happy to prescribe another medication for you. You could say I've been very lucky. I have been lucky. Tomorrow I could be unlucky. I know how the world works. But the fact of the matter is, I've also watched everything I've put in my mouth for 30 years. I've taken mega doses of vitamin C, vitamin E, B vitamins, and various doses of garlic and wine and vodka and beer. And all of them have worked uh, superbly, as have my daily bicycle rides, uh, which Dr. Kellogg highly recommended uh, uh, for your balance, if not for anything else. We'll talk about how much you need to exercise in a moment. But again, I want to go back to the overall statement that I'm making about Uh, why I am on a non-dairy diet. About six months ago, no, about a year ago, I started to get severe pains in my in my feet, not in my legs, but in the ball of my foot where I was limping. And my left hand, I couldn't close it. And I said, this is absurd. I, don't, I shouldn't have arthritis. I'm in good health. Well, I again went back to my own writings of 30 years ago, and I said, doctor, practice what you preach. Dr. Savage, practice what you preach. Don't you remember writing 30 years ago that the literature was uh, filled with evidence that certain people cannot tolerate dairy because they do not have sufficient quantities of lactase to to, to, uh, break down the lactose found in milk products? And that some people get relief from arthritis by eliminating all dairy. That means hard cheeses, that means milk, that means ice cream, etc. Well, guess what happened? I gave up all dairy, and I mean butter. I mean small amounts of milk and coffee. I mean what I loved the most, which was Parmesan cheese, Pecorino Romano. I loved it. I was on everything. I won't touch it. And you know what? I stopped limping, and my hand is fine. And if I cheat on my diet so much as one meal, the pain comes back. So as I say to you, you want to have a good discussion about real health care reform, real health insurance reform. It starts at your dinner table. You are the ultimate doctor to yourself. Don't rely upon anyone else until you absolutely need them. Anyway, these are some of the topics that I want to talk about today. We also have sound of President Obama in Mexico, of all places, promising the Mexicans once again that health care reform is on the way and that Uncle Schmuck will give them all a gold-plated medical care system if only he can continue to BS the public a little bit more. I'll be right back. Savage. Doctors take their Hippocratic oath too seriously. This is the compassionate 
uh, Ezekiel Emmanuel. That's Ram's brother. He says, doctors take the Hippocratic Oath too seriously. And he says, uh, doctors should look beyond the needs of their patients and consider social justice. Those are progressive words, social justice. Such as whether the money could be better spent on somebody else. So in other words, if you have a grandmother with Parkinson's who's had a good life, that money could be better spent on a young Mexican illegal alien. After all, that young Mexican illegal alien has not yet uh, had a long good life. So according to Rahm Emanuel's brother, Ezekiel Emanuel, your grandmother should not be treated for Parkinson's, but that money should be spent on the illegal alien five-year-old, perhaps uh, because that child has a longer road ahead, and we need social justice. Okay, moving on. Privacy is something that is rapidly disappearing under this administration. Liberals. Ha. Huh. It will only get worse from the far-left Obama administration. Joining us now is Dr. Peter Bregan to talk about the latest intrusions into our private lives by Obama's minions. Michael, I went to a private medical clinic a few days ago, sat in the waiting room, and found myself in a state-of-the-art home theater with a flat-screen TV on the wall and very comfy chairs neatly arranged for good viewing. CNN's medical expert Sanjay Gupta was talking to me in his unctuous way about adult ADHD. Then a smooth lady psychiatrist from Harvard told us about the symptoms of adult ADHD, things like having trouble concentrating, a short attention span, and procrastinating. These, of course, are the ways most people behave when they really don't want to do what they are doing. The balanced presentation ended up flashing vivid pictures of pill bottles. First came a batch of three, Ritalin, Concerta, and Adderall. Brand names were mentioned, but no one said that these are highly addictive chemicals classified among the most dangerous narcotics by the DEA. Never mind, they make young people prone to cocaine abuse in later years, that they cause sudden cardiac death in young people and stunt growth. Never mind that they have no proven benefits beyond suppressing all spontaneous behavior for a few weeks. Then they flashed a bottle of Stratera on the screen and called it a non-stimulant treatment for ADHD when it's one of the more stimulating drugs around town. Not to mention it has a black box warning about causing suicide. Used to be that the pharmaceutical company salespersons had to wait patiently beside us in the waiting room before getting to the doctors or they had to buy lunch for the whole clinic. Now they pop into the office Go to the digital video hanging on the wall and insert a new promotional DVD. The ads get into the heads of the patients before they even see their doctors. How do they get away with touting these drugs to the public without the required and ethically necessary warnings? Where is the FDA when you need them? Where they usually are, peeking out of the backside pants pocket of the drug companies. It's summertime. Why are they targeting young adults now? Good question, Michael. I think it's because young adults are getting ready to go back to college where the illegal use of these drugs is pandemic. Stimulant drugs enforce compulsivity and cause insomnia, so they help students cram all night for tests. Doesn't guarantee they're going to learn anything, but at least they can stay up all night. Recreationally, students mix these drugs with alcohol, making a dangerous cocktail of uppers and downers. These waiting room ads with their lists of symptoms prime the youngsters to say the right thing moments later in the doctor's office. The right thing that will get them a prescription for these dangerous drugs, whether for their own use or for sharing with friends or for selling on campus. Well, this is something out of Orwell's 1984. Yes, it's happening in doctor's offices around the country, thousands of them. Imagine what it will be like under socialized medicine when Barack Obama looks at us from the screen and explains how we got to start rationing our medical care. He will urge old guys like me not to use up so many medical resources. Progressives view our aging citizens the way they view our supposedly aging economy, as a burden on the rest of humanity. I'd like to see a waiting room rebellion, Patients standing up to demand good old-fashioned TV like the Fox News Channel or even CNN. And maybe a remote to change the stations when they want to. Meanwhile, it's not just the waiting room that's going digital. 
is our private medical records under national health care. Right now around the country, people are being forced by their state governments to take psychiatric drugs. It's called outpatient commitment. Demoralized patients call me asking how they can stop their state officials from breaking into their homes to shoot them up with long-acting, mind-destroying antipsychotic drugs. There's even an underground railroad for helping these poor souls to escape to new places to live. So people will be forced to take treatments that they may not want under Obama's government socialized medicine? Yes, Michael. Forced preventative treatment fits the public health aims of socialized medicine. A shy boy will be diagnosed as pre-schizophrenic and forced to take ruinous antipsychotic drugs. Eventually, people may be forced to take prescribed treatments for their cholesterol, blood pressure, or diabetes, or even for cancer. And if you're labeled with a stigmatizing diagnosis or forced to take treatment, as you suggested, there will be no place to escape under universal health care with universal record keeping. You will drag your medical record behind you like a digital ball and chain. So let's keep the government out of medicine and the pharmaceutical companies out of our waiting rooms. That brings me, as always, to my refrain, to my weekly report on Savage Nation. Protect freedom. Take responsibility at all times. Express gratitude for all your gifts and opportunities. Become a source of love. You can listen to these radio reports and you can download the transcripts for all of them at www.bregan.com. That's B-R-E-G-G-I-N dot com. Thanks, Dr. Bregan. This is the Savage Nation. With God's will and your listenership, I shall return. Savage. You are listening to Michael Savage Archives on Really Big Something Channel.